Hi, my name is Shai Silberberg. I'm a program director at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the National Institutes of Health. However, today I'm here to provide my personal perspective on the so-called reproducibility crisis. This is a timely issue because these days it appears that every other week there's a paper in either the lay or scientific literature highlighting problems with the ability to reproduce scientific findings. Sadly, many of these publications either implicitly or explicitly imply wrongdoing on the part of scientists, unjustly tainting the entire scientific community. So to help put things in perspective, let's describe what it means when results are reproducible, and then identify factors that might lead to low reproducibility. As I'm sure you all know, advances in science are primarily built on prior findings. Results that do not stand the test of time get abandoned, whereas results that can be reproduced serve as the foundation for future discoveries. In this process, however, results that cannot be reproduced can slow the progress of science, and therefore it is important to identify the key factors that lead to low reproducibility and to find mechanisms to mitigate them to the best of our ability. Now, there are many reasons that can lead to low reproducibility. I list three of them over here. So, for one, complex innovative techniques developed by one group might require extensive training before it can be utilized by others. Until this knowledge is gained, it might appear that the initial results aren't reproducible. Second, at times, variables which influence the outcome of the experiment are unknown to the investigator, and therefore, they are not reported. If these so-called confounding variables happen to be different in labs trying to reproduce the results, they might not get the same answer. Now, an interesting example of a confounding variable is the story of the horse Clever Hans. This was a horse who was believed to be able to solve arithmetic problems. His trainer would say, Hans, three times two, and the horse would kick six times. It turned out, however, that this very clever horse was actually reading the body language of the trainer, who was totally unaware that his, he was providing physical cues when the horse should stop kicking. So in this case, the trainer is a confounding variable. You remove the trainer from the room, and the horse can no longer count. The third issue I mention here is issues with resources. Much has been said in recent, recent years about misidentification of cell lines and the poor quality of many antibodies and other reagents. If two labs think that they are using the same cell line to do similar experiments, but in actual fact they are using very different cells, then it wouldn't be surprising if they don't get the same result. As you can see, none of these three variables that I provide here have anything to do with the integrity of the scientist producing the work. However, we could improve the reproducibility of such experiments if there was greater transparency in the reporting of experimental design, conduct, and analysis. So with that said, I would like to focus my talk on what I personally believe are major contributing factors to low reproducibility. And these are unintentional and unconscious bias, what I call human nature, and chance and publication bias. Let's start with human nature. In his amazing Cooper Union address, Abraham Lincoln said that human action can be modified to some extent, but human nature cannot be changed. This is a profound statement, because what he's actually saying is that we have to recognize as humans that we have limitations, and we have to do our best to minimize their impact. Now, obviously, Mr. Lincoln was not talking about science, but four decades later, Thomas Chamberlain did just that. Thomas Chamberlain was a geologist, and what he proposed is when scientists design experiments, they should test multiple hypotheses in parallel, not just one. Because if we choose our favorite hypothesis, then unconsciously we tend to magnify results that support our hypothesis and overlook results that do not. Okay. So Chamberlain was describing one of many forms of bias which are inherent to all human beings, including scientists. Importantly, all these biases are unintentional and unconscious, and therefore have absolutely nothing to do with scientific misconduct.
Now, bias is very real. It's not a myth, and it lurks behind every corner. To give you just one example, here's a study that was conducted more than half a century ago. And in this study, the investigators used, as you can see, 14 rodents and 39 homo sapiens in the form of students. Now, this ratio seems rather odd until you realize that the experimental subjects in this experiment were actually the students. This was part of the course in experimental psychology, and the students were asked over a entire semester to train animals to do different uh, tasks, and they measured how long it took them to learn. Now, there was a trick to this experiment. The students were led to believe that there were two types of animals. There were dull animals, that were genetically bred not to be smart, and then there were the bright animals that were genetically bred to be smarter. Okay? Now, in actual fact, these were all randomly selected animals. Now, before each experiment, the students were told whether on that particular day they're going to be studying a dull or bright animal. Now, as I'm sure you've guessed by now, at the end of the experiment, at the end of the semester, after repeating this experiment five times, it was found that, on average, the students found that the bright animals learn faster. Okay. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what could have been done to minimize this expectation bias. All that was needed was to mask the identity of the animals from the students conducting the, conducting the experiments and the students analyzing the results. This is known as blinding, and it's an effective way to minimize some types of bias. And in most cases, it is not that difficult to employ... Uh, to, to use blinding. All that is needed is to ask someone in the lab or the adjacent lab to code the samples and to reveal the code only after the experiments are complete. So, blinding should be a serious consideration when conducting experiments. However, when blind... if blinding is actually used, is often not reported. To give you just one example, in this study, the investigators scanned seven high-profile journals for papers that included animal trials and that were cited at least 500 times each. These are high-impact papers. And what they found was that while approximately 70% of the papers provided information on how the effect depended on the concentration of the compound being uh, used, what's known as a dose-response curve, only 20% reported whether the experiments were blinding and even less reported on whether the animals were randomly assigned to the different comparison groups, a topic I don't have time to discuss now. So, as you can see, there is lack of transparency in reporting and blinding, but this is not only a matter of reporting, there's indirect evidence that this also not being used. So, to give you one example, I'm giving a very schematic view here. In this study, the investigators looked at all the papers that examined the effect of a particular compound in an experimental model of stroke. And what they did is, for each paper, they looked to see how many important parameters were described in the paper that might influence bias, for example, blinding and randomization. Okay? And they gave a score for the overall parameters that were reported in the paper. And in parallel, they also recorded how many... I mean, what magnitude effect the drug had in that particular paper. And those results are shown here. What you can see is that the more parameters were reported, the smaller the reported effect size. Or the reverse, the fewer parameters it reported, the greater the effect size, suggesting that lack of reporting is associated with lack of practice and that lack of practice can lead to bias. Now, not all forms of bias are so straightforward, like blinding. So, let's imagine... Um, this, this is uh, to help you imagine, okay? So, uh, let's imagine that for the last few weeks you've been on pins and needles, waiting to hear if your very first publication will be accepted for publication in a high-profile journal. And then, finally, you get an answer from the editor. And this answer says that if you can fortify your results with just one more set of experiments, they will seriously consider your manuscript for publication. Oh, you're so excited. Your very first paper is so close. And you're confident that it'll take you no more than two weeks to get the desired results. Wait a minute. 
hold that thought. Did I just hear you think that you are sure you can get the right answer within a couple of weeks? If I read your thoughts correctly, then you might have just jeopardized your credibility as a scientist. And in fact, you might have even contributed to their reproducibility crisis. If you proceed with the experiments without carefully designing them to minimize bias, such as blinding yourself, then expectation bias and the pressures to publish high-profile papers uh, might lead you to get the desired result instead of the true result. So as you can see, it's extremely important to design your experiments to minimize bias. With that said, I'd like to switch to the second topic that I mentioned earlier, and that is publication bias. As we all know, we typically start research uh, with a question, we then generate an hypothesis to test it, and then design experiments to test our hypothesis. Now, we do the experiments, and if the results support our hypothesis, we are very happy, we're often also very proud of ourselves for coming up with such a great hypothesis, and we'll do our best to publish the results. These are known as positive results. If, however, we get what's called negative results, the results do not support our hypothesis, many times we'll simply file them away and they won't see the light of day. This is also known as the file drawer problem. Okay? So if you now combine publication bias with the element of chance, then you have a recipe for low reproducibility. To help understand this point, let's look at a really cool study that was conducted by the ALS Therapy Development Institute and published back in 2008. What they did is they had information about uh, uh, this animal model called the SOD1 mouse. It's an animal model used to study ALS. And they had information about many, many animals that served as controls in different experiments. In fact, they had more than 2,000 animals. And they knew everything about these animals, when they were born and when they died, and what litter they came from, what their sex was, and so on and so forth. So what they did is they put all this information into a database, and then they conducted this really cool in silico experiment. What they did is they randomly selected animals from this database and put them in two separate groups. And they asked, what is the probability of seeing at least a 5% difference in the mean life expectancy between these two groups? Which by definition would be by chance because all these animals are control animals that lived out their lives. Okay. And what they found after repeating this experiment thousands and thousands of times, that if you have 10 animals per group, okay, then on average, you have about a 10% chance of seeing a significant result of 5% difference in their uh, life expectancy. Now, some of you might think that getting the right answer 9 out of 10 times is not bad. But in actual fact, if you combine this with the element, with, with publication bias, you can see how it is a problem. So let's imagine that there are 10 groups that, that decide to test an effect of a particular drug in this ALS model. Nine groups see that the drug has no effect, and they file the results away. They're not interesting. They don't publish them. And then one group, by chance, gets an effect, and this is what gets published in a high-profile journal. So you can see how publication bias and chance gave rise to an irreproducible result. So what can we do to try to improve reproducibility? Well, first and foremost, we need to increase transparency in reporting. And to do that, we need to use review. We need reviewers of manuscripts and grants to pay greater attention to the information provided in these documents. The importance for transparency in reporting has been recently recognized by both journals and funding agencies. So for example, NIH has recently made changes to the review process to assure that particularly important information is included in the grant applications. Several journals have added checklists to help them uh, uh, identify which parameters are included in the manuscript and which are not. Okay. The second point is we need to somehow deal with unconscious bias and deficiencies in experimental procedures. Okay. To this, what we need is education. We need to train the scientific community to understand 
that we are all prone to, to bias and that therefore precautions that we take during the experiment are not just for the sake of, of, of uh, adding difficulty, but they actually serve an important purpose. Dealing with publication bias is a greater nut to crack because that will require a change in culture. We need to somehow shift the focus from glitter and focus more on rigor. So if you're part of the scientific uh, enterprise, I would like to, to uh, uh, point you to a few important points. First, we must all recognize that we are all prone to unconscious bias. And because this is the case, we need to critically assess results and publications. We need to rigorously design, uh, execute, and analyze experiments. We should plan experiments to disprove the hypothesis, not to prove that it's right. And we should need to favor uh, robust findings. But if it appears to be too good to be true, it probably is. So I'd like to end with the words of the great physicist Richard, uh, uh, Richard Feynman, who said that if you're doing an experiment, you should report everything that you think might make it invalid, not only what you think is right about. Think about these profound words the next time you're reading, writing, or reviewing a manuscript. I'd like to thank you for your attention, to thank NINDS leadership for giving me the opportunity to devote time to this important topic, Andrew Nowak for photography, Lauren Ulrich for illustrations, and my daughter Liran for putting a smile on my face. Thank you.